we are training the next generation to meet the strategic challenges of tomorrow. We are dedicated to understanding in order to act better. All right, my name is uh, Jonathan Paquin. Uh, on behalf of the Canadian Network for Strategic Analysis, it is a great pleasure to co-host this conference with the European Initiative for Security Studies and the, Citad the Citadel's Department of Intelligence and Security Studies, as well as the Citadel's Department of Political Science. We just had a wonderful first panel uh, entitled Military Lessons Learned from the War in Ukraine. Uh, we now turn to our second panel uh, entitled War Termination and the Post-War Settlement. What does a political settlement look like? I would like to introduce the chair of this second panel, Dr. Jack Porter. Dr. Porter is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the Citadel here in Charleston, South Carolina where he teaches courses on international relations, comparative politics, U.S. national security policy, theories of peace and war, and international law. Currently, Dr. Porter is working on several projects that include civil military relations and the transition to democracy, uh, counterinsurgency strategies and power, as well as uh, religion in democratic militaries. So, Dr. Porter, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. I will now turn the floor to you for this exciting second panel. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan, Hugo, and all the sponsoring institutions for this wonderful opportunity and the privilege to chair such a, a renowned panel. I'd also like to welcome all the audience members to what promises to be a fascinating and extremely informative panel. And we are fortunate to be joined by three prolific and internationally renowned scholars that will address issues related to two interrelated topics, the likelihood of the war coming to an end and the prospects of a lasting peace, peace conflict, a post-conflict peace settlement. Uh, I will introduce our three panelists first, and then I'll have one, one or two opening remarks, and then I'll turn to some specific questions for each of the panelists. So our panelists are Dr. Justin Massey, who is a full professor of political science at the University de Quebec à Montreal and a co-director co of the National of Network for Strategic Analysis. He was a 2019 Fulbright Visiting Research Scholar in Canada-U.S. Relations at Johns Hopkins University, a School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C. His research focuses on global power transition, multinational military coalitions, and Canadian foreign and defense policy. He has an extremely prolific publishing record, including numerous journal articles and a number of books in both French and in English. Our second panelist is Dr. Maria Popova. Uh, Maria Popova is an associate professor at political science at McGill University and co-director of the Jean Monnet Central in Montreal, Jean Monnet Center in Montreal. She held the Jean Monnet Chair, Europe and the Rule of Law in 2017 to 2021. Her work explores the rule of law and democracy in, post -communist, uh, in the post-communist region. She also has a very distinguished public publication record as well. And then finally, Professor Oksana Chavel's research and teaching focus on the post-communist region surrounding Russia and issues such as nation and state building, the politics of citizenship and migration, memory and religious politics and challenges to democratization in the post-Soviet region. She is also the author of a award-winning book, Migration, Refugee Policy and State Building in Post-Communist Europe. So um, thank you everyone and welcome panelists. Just one brief introductory remark in drawing on some of the analogies in the earlier cases that were introduced by both the keynote speaker and some of the or panelists in the earlier uh, uh, round table. History is replete with wars that were expected to be brief, perhaps most famously World War I, at the start of which, in, in August 1941, German Emperor Wilhelm II famously pro promised to his departing troops that they would return before the autumn leaves fell, only to see these pred predictions go awry. Obviously, World War I lasted over four years with approximately 16.5 million uh, total casualties. 9.7 million military and 6.8 million civilian. 
Similar predictions of brief war were made by, by many a year ago with Russian, when Russian forces invaded the Ukraine, only once again to see these forecasts frustrated. Interestingly, World War I also provides important lessons on the difficulty of developing a post-settlement that can last and, 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 and be resilient. So I look forward to turning to our panelists and getting their insights into the prospects of war termination, as well as the likelihood of a lasting and effective post-conflict peace settlement. My first question will be for Justin. Justin, one of the scenarios is that the war turns into a protracted conflict. What does this mean for the current pace and scale of Western assistance? Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and thanks, Jonathan, for uh, having invited me. Uh, and I'm glad to be here uh, physically in, in Citadel to, to attend this conference. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a protracted, protracted conflict is, I think, the most likely outcome of this war. But to get to that point, I think we need to uh, examine the other two scenarios to exclude them. And two that scenarios that would be more optimal. The first one would be a total victory. Of course, from one side or another, that this is what they, they achieve. But both sides don't have the capacity to achieve this. Now, we have to look at their war aims. Uh, uh, Ukraine's war aims are, are quite clear. It's the restoration of its 1991 borders. Now, its capacity to do this is very much limited by the restraint military support provided by the West, of course, and the sizable uh, cap capabilities of, of the Russian military, despite its setbacks. From Russia's point of view, its objectives have been uh, diminishing since the last year, which began in December 2021 as the what it demanded then was that NATO returned to 1997 borders and deny accession of Ukraine and Georgia to NATO. Then it went to the demilitarization, denazification and liberation of Luhansk and Donetsk Oblast. And lately, it has been more about recapturing the four annexed regions that it does not control, uh, actually, at this moment. But President Putin has very limited capability to escalate more of this war, to achieve those war aims, even though they are limited. Therefore, its capacity to impose total victory, whether for, from, uh, the, for the surrender of Kyiv or even just to achieve uh, the control of these four regions, is very much unlikely. Uh, the second uh, optim more optimal outcome would be a negotiated settlement uh, through an armistice or a ceasefire. Which, but to achieve this, to uh, to attain this point, there would need to be an exhaustion of both belligerents, which would lead to a temporary peace. And if you look at the statement by both Zelensky and Putin lately, there's no will at all. There's both. Uh, in both uh, capitals, there's a, um, a projection of more gains to be made this winter or this spring. So there's absolutely little reception for, say, the Chinese peace plan that was proposed uh, this week uh, to impose a, a temporary ceasefire. And from a uh, Ukrainian point of view, any temporary uh, uh, ceasefire would be, of course, temporary because the fear would be and very much uh, 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 realistic fear would be that the uh, Russian military would simply rearm, reconstitute, and, and attack again, of course, to, to achieve more uh, territorial gains. And so the, the requirements for this would be significant security guarantees, if not third-party intervention on its soil to, to, uh, to implement that, such a ceasefire. There's no will at the UN. There's no will, of course, from NATO to have troops on the ground. So the capacity to even uh, achieve that uh, ceasefire and maintain it are, in my mind, very limited. So given the fact that these two other options are very unlikely, uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's obvious to me that the protracted conflict is the most likely outcome. Um, it's going to be tough to resolve given that both countries believe that war is existential to its national to their national interests and that the the problem of credible uh, commitments both cannot credibly commit to the other that for instance russia will not want to attack again ukraine and kiev has no credibility in saying to russia that it would not want to see closer ties with the west joining the eu joining nato wanting more nato weapons on its soil to defend itself for 
obvious reasons. And so and given that, I think that war is far from uh, finished. Thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Popova. How is the war likely to end, in your opinion? And what would we know about war termination? Or what do we know about war termination and post-conflict resolution, either from case studies or what the literature may have to say about this? Thanks uh, for this question. And uh, thanks for the invitation to take part in this uh, panel. Um, I think I'll start with, uh, with the question of what does end actually mean in this war? And, and that's actually quite a complicated uh, question. I mean, that's something that the literature uh, does recognize, that it is actually very hard to pinpoint when a war ends. There are a lot of false uh, ceasefires and, and also a lot of uh, conflicts that restart because the end was not actually satisfactory to the sides. And in this war, um, an end to the war means Russia giving up the goal of controlling Ukraine, because that is at the core of this uh, war. Uh, it is not uh, Russia trying uh, to, uh, impo to take a particular region, uh, not really Russia trying to protect any uh, so-called Russian speakers, uh, in Ukraine, it's not about uh, trying to prevent uh, Ukraine from entering NATO because Russia is afraid of NATO. We now know for sure that that is not uh, the reason for this war, as Russia has not strenuously objected and doesn't show any signs of being afraid of its other member, uh, other neighbors entering NATO. So the goal really. Um, here that is driving this war is Russia's intention to establish control over Ukraine somehow, uh, whether it's through conquering the entire country or through keeping uh, part of Ukrainian territory and then using it as a potential um, as a potential tool and lever on uh, the uh, on the on the central Ukrainian government in order to limit their range of options in how they act in uh, domestic and in foreign policy. And what we know from the post-Soviet era is that Russia has used this kind of uh, tactic uh, before. Uh, the frozen uh, conflict, for example, in uh, Moldova, um, works uh, for Russia's goal of uh, making sure that Moldova is, um, you know, tied because of this uh, uh, frozen conflict in Transnistria, its foreign policy has very much been limited by it. So if, uh, if the end of this war uh, will happen only when Russia gives up on this goal of controlling Ukraine, then um, I would definitely agree with uh, Justin here that uh, we're not likely to see an end um, anytime soon. It is probably going to be a protracted uh, war. And if we see an end of hostilities in some way, um, you know, maybe the conflict might be frozen along a particular uh, line of contact. Uh, maybe Russia will be denied uh, control over X percentage of Ukrainian territory, but we'll get to keep uh, some of Ukrainian territory. Um, even if uh, Ukraine manages to uh, recapture all of the territory, um, going back to its 91 borders, even that is not actually a full victory and not an end. Um, obviously, that's what Ukraine is trying to do, but uh, even if it succeeds in doing it, it's not an end uh, to the conflict unless Russia gives up on the idea of reconquering later. Um, so because of that uh, situation, I think the most likely way uh, that this will end will have to be um, a military so solution, military end of some sort, depending on, on military capabilities on both sides. 
and then uh, prolonged containment of Russia uh, to make sure that um, it does not act on what is likely to be a continued goal of uh, controlling Ukraine. So uh, I think we the the we have to be realistic that it is not likely that Russia will give up this goal um, soon. So uh, the solution here, post end of uh, military uh, action, is to have a way to deter Russia and uh, contain it uh, until. Uh, there is some sort of domestic change within Russia uh, that uh, somehow not only regime change, but some discussion within Russian society that uh, that the goal of controlling Ukraine has turned out to be uh, way too costly for them. And some uh, some decision and some movement within Russian society that starts and within the uh, Russian political uh, elites that starts making this argument. We have to give up on this idea of controlling Ukraine because it is no longer in our interest. It's very hard. The Ukrainians don't want us. Um, none of these things are now uh, internalized and realized within Russia. That could change domestically at some point. But until that changes, uh, the goal uh, of a post uh, war settlement would be to contain Russia's intention of uh, launching a war again. So I'll end here for now. Well, thank you very much. I'll turn uh, in the, this initial round to Professor Chevelle and ask a question. Would you? What measures can be taken to bring about an end to the war on the terms favorable to Ukraine, or perhaps what might happen that may lead to an end of the war on Russia's terms? Um, thank you for the question. Um, thank you for also inviting me to take part um, in this conversation. Um, I'll start by um, sort of maybe broadening the question a little bit, because I think when they're asking about, you know, what are the terms favorable to Ukraine, I think it's very important to have great clarity on what is this war ultimately about, both for Ukraine and implications beyond Ukraine. And um, I'll echo some of the things Maria said already. I think this Putin's uh, determination to vassalize Ukraine, to control Ukraine, makes this re really an existential fight for Ukraine. So it's not, again, uh, the way the Ukrainians look at it, they don't really have an option of uh, some sort of, you know, surrender of part of the territory or some kind of compromise with Russia, because the goal of the Russian government is really to destroy Ukrainian nation and Ukrainian state. So I think that's very important. And that's why, you know, if we look at, say, opinion polls from Ukraine, you know, 90% of the population, sometimes even more, 95%, really overwhelming majorities, want to continue to fight. They consider territorial compromises unacceptable. And even when the question is posed, what if there is, say, a tactical nuclear strike, Ukrainians still say we still will, will fight, right? So it's not that people are are suicidal, but they really see the stakes as that high and they are that high for Ukraine. Now, but this conflict is also not just about Ukraine, because if we think about, okay, if Ukraine were to lose, maybe that's just, you know, too bad for Ukraine, we can't be sorry, you know, for it, for the people. But ultimately, the rest of the world can maybe go on as before. I think that would be a mistake to think that, because really, you know, if Russia is allowed to prevent in Ukraine, it appends the entire security architecture that kept peace in Europe for over 50 years. It creates a precedent where a nuclear superpower essentially can go and take a chunk of territory. We can imagine all sorts of scenarios for European and global security, how that would be really bad. It encourages you know, nuclear proliferation. It encourages autocrats to go and you know, attack their neighbors. So we're likely to see more conflict, you know, really dangerous world. So Ukrainian um, you know, end of, of the conflict in terms favorable to Ukraine is in the interest of not only of Ukraine, but I would say democracies broadly, Europe certainly broadly. Um, so that's kind of, you know, what to keep in mind. Now, so what could be done to bring an end on terms favorable to Ukraine? Um, again, as I'll, I'll repeat what Maria also mentioned briefly. Um, I think the, the outcome, given these existential stakes and essentially very little, no overlap in the positions of the two sides in this war um, is going to be determined on the battlefield. So uh, the weaponry, additional weapons that Ukraine has been asking this 
full time, I think would be very important to provide. Um, and um, I mean, my personal opinion is that these, you know, predictions or expectations that Ukraine cannot prevail militarily, that, you know, we are looking at some potentially like Iran-Iraq war 25 years years of, you know, the border is essentially the contact line not moving. I think it's a little bit too early for this, because if we look at, say, how the conflict unfolded since the beginning, you know, a year ago, if we had this conversation, most people, you know, didn't expect Ukraine to last a couple of weeks, right? Not only did Ukraine survive, its military proved incredibly capable, and every time it received additional weapons, it was able to surprise the world in recapture territory. Now, I'm not going to say that Ukraine can really, like, we basically don't know, can it accomplish the goal of liberating its, um, you know, so recognized borders? Maybe, maybe not, but certainly, um, it's, I think it, with the better weapons, it certainly has a very good chance to liberate more territory. Now, what might happen then, and this is another point um, I want to make, that I think we should be very flexible in our kind of expectations and be prepared for a variety of scenarios because of course everybody fears escalation and especially nuclear escalation that of course makes sense but we don't really know what kinds of scenarios would lead to what kind of response from russia so, so the, the idea that putin you know will escalate can he escalate hypothetical of course he can but under what scenario we don't really know um, so, for example, you know, if Ukraine were to go on another successful offensive and recaptured, say, part of the southern territory over the spring and summer months, what would happen in Russia? Like, we don't really know. On the one hand, Putin announced these territories as an X and they're part of Russia. Supposedly, it could generate nuclear response, but Ukraine already retaken Kherson. It bombed Crimean Bridge. There has been, um, you know, some also um, explosions and things like this within Russia that Ukrainians have caused, and we didn't see this kind of escalation that everybody fears because nuclear response is not in Putin's interest. Now, does it mean we have to dismiss this possibility entirely? Of course not. But I guess what I'm trying to say that there could be, and I think the West should be prepared for a variety of possible scenarios. And that's also the last point that I'll make, sort of, you know, what, what about Russia? Can something be done or potentially happen on the terms favorable to Russia? I think we don't, I mean, I don't think Russia has a path to victory in this war, so I'll just sort of start with that. But then what kind of resilience that regime has, I think we also don't really know. Um, you know, the literature on um, breakdown of authoritarian regimes pretty much, you know, points to the fact that usually these breakdowns, even when they happen, are often quite sudden. So again, doesn't mean that Putin regime will necessarily fall, but also I think this expectation that if Ukraine keeps having a success on the battlefield, eventually Putin will go nuclear. Um, I would treat that with a great deal of skepticism and sort of more look at the precedents. You know, what has been done already? How did Putin respond? What might, might happen within his regime if, say, they have another defeat on the battlefield of substantial proportion like they had in the fall? It might create, uh, um, you know, uh, processes within this regime that it may not be that strong anymore. And again, I think it would be important to be prepared for this. So again, basically, that's my, um, I, I will end here. Um, I think definitely more weapon for Ukraine before declaring that the conflict, you know, neither side can prevail because I think Ukraine has surprised the world before and uh, has a chance um, definitely to regain at least more territory. And then this flexibility in the response and being prepared for potentially very different options. Uh, and um, it, including what might happen in Russia. And then finally, keeping these broader stakes in this conflict in mind. That it's not just about Ukraine, it is literally about the future of European security and democracy globally more broadly. Thank you. Thank you. I was also uh, just reminded that I need to slow my speech down a little bit because so we are trying to translate this uh, you know, both in, 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 into French. And so um, if we it can keep our kind of speech a little slower, I think that will, will help facilitate the translation process. Thank you. I tend to speak a little bit quickly and I need to be reminded. So thank you. Um, I did have a quick follow-up question before we turn to another round of questions that deal more directly with a post-conflict peace settlement. And with the exception of a, a brief mention earlier in the earlier panel about what lessons learned for China might be, we haven't talked much about the role China might play in terms of war termination. Or And so I was wondering if any of the panelists had any comments on what role China might play in either prolonging the conflict or in some way facilitating some pathway towards war termination. 
or other, maybe perhaps not just China, but other non-Western, non-European states? Uh, one role that, that China could obviously play is, is to push for Russia to change its war aims and retreat its military. But we've obviously seen that this is not its peace plan as proposed this week, and its desire to maintain its strategic and comprehensive partnership with Russia is jeopardizing the achievement of peace and its unwillingness to respect uh, the UN Charter um, uh, clauses of, of national sovereignty and inter territorial integrity, I think is also uh, inconsistent with its uh, discourses. Um, President Zelensky uh, received, I think, uh, well, it, the, well, the intention behind Chinese, the Chinese peace plan, but said it would be great if he could have the opportunity to speak with uh, the Chinese president, which he was not afforded to, uh, uh, but President Putin was twice since the beginning of this war. And so we see clearly uh, the um, intentions between uh, behind uh, China's peace plan that is not necessarily conducive to a durable peace because besides the intentions, there's no willingness to actually put the concrete proposal on the ground and, and uh, 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 overcome the principal cause of this war that Maria and Oksana pointed out very clearly, Russia's revanchism and revenge uh, ambitions and, and territorial uh, ambitions. Unless the, the Chinese can put pressure on Russia, similarly as they did on uh, its, um, uh, to prevent it from using tactical nuclear weapons, if it can have that same capability to, uh, to uh, pressure uh, Moscow, that would be a game changer, I think, but we're not seeing this. Dr. Popova or yeah, um, I will add that I mean China can can play a, a significant role. Justin mentioned it could pressure uh, Russia to uh, to scale back and uh, to be more realistic about how it cannot actually achieve its goals. China has not done that. What is dangerous is that. Uh, now there is a possibility that China would actually uh, support Russia's uh, war effort through military aid. And of course, that would be disastrous. Uh, I mean, it, it would prolong the war for sure rather than uh, shorten it. And uh, but one thing I wanted to point out is that I think we should not be uh, in there, there are often attempts to paint China here as some sort of neutral actor, but it, it really is not neutral uh, at all in this conflict. It is much closer to the Russian position, has been from the start, has abstained in the UN mostly, which is basically tacit support for Russia. Um, so I think what that means is that China really lacks credibility as any sort of mediator here, because it is clearly leaning heavily to one side rather than being in the middle. And, um, and obviously China's interests here are undermining uh, or to undermine uh, Western interests, the US mainly um, in um, on the international arena. So it is not uh, really kind of an outside actor that maybe uh, doesn't have much at stake and therefore can uh, can propose some sort of um, uh, mediation. Um, I don't think China is in that position. Thank you. Uh, Professor Cheval, did you have a... Yeah, I'll agree with this. I'll just uh, maybe very briefly add that um, I also personally very skeptical for exactly the reasons Maria mentioned that China can play some sort of neutral mediation role because it is not really a neutral party. Now, now, that said, I think the fact that China is not interested very clearly so in a nuclear escalation, I mean, if that probably is sort of one positive that I could see from Chinese involvement, because if they could, um, you know, can, on their own, kind of from their side to be a signaling to Putin and potentially putting some pressure on him to not even consider that, that type of escalation, I mean, that's a positive. Uh, but otherwise, um, I think the um, you know the potential for China to play some sort of neutral mediator role and uh, you know or implement this plan that they revealed, I see that very unlikely because again the the goals of the two sides are, are what they are, and I think it's very unlikely that you know that China can influence.
influence that. Now, the, 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 maybe one more thing to add, kind of China, leaving China aside, I think there is something for the West to think about and to do, do to try to do about of um, countering this Russian message to the developing world, to the global South, that they are some sort sort of like anti-imperialist force and that they want the multipolar world and all of that nonsense, um, you know, excuse my <laughs> a categorical statement here, because of course, I mean, this is not about multipolarity. It is about Russia basically being able to dominate and, you know, not be challenged by the US and, you know, all, but, but it is for, for, for a variety of reasons, you know, having to do with history, having to do with US own policy policies um, is falling on many receptive ears in the global south, this narrative that there is this US that, you know, imperialism and Russia is somehow anti-imperial power. Um, so I think, um, you know, if um, we are talking about possibility for countries, nations, or groups of nations from the global south to play a role in the conflict, I think starting with challenging this Russian narrative about what they are really about um, and how they are the good guy, quote unquote, against US, the bad guy. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to turn our attention to a second round of questions, ones that deal more directly with a post-conflict peace settlement and what the dimensions and features that that might entail. So I'll, again, I'll turn to Justin first. And Justin, in your opinion, what security commitments can Ukraine expect from Western powers, especially the United States? The first point I want to make is that these uh, security commitments are fundamental notwithstanding any of the scenarios that I've discussed earlier. Whether it's a protracted war, of course, uh, Ukraine would need more ammunition, more artillery, more uh, military support, of course. If there was a ceasefire, it would be temporary, it would need third-party uh, enforcement to be credible. It would need, thus, more Western military support. If the Ukrainian uh, military uh, was victorious and was able to inflict prohibitive costs on the Russian military for it to, to retreat, it would need much more military assistance than it's getting right now from the United States, Europe, and Canada. And if the Ukrainians, Ukrainians were defeated, unfortunately, um, there would still be some resistance in the, some parts of the country that would need aid. There would be a, a need for massive re, re, rearmament of bordering allies from Slovakia, Hungary, Poland, to, uh, to Romania, a bolstering even more than, than what was announced of NATO's uh, EFP, and perhaps inviting Moldova uh, to join NATO to prevent further escalation, uh, uh, geographical escalation of this war. So any scenario rests upon that continued, if not increasing, Western military support. Unfortunately, I've looked at three indicators of whether we can expect that to continue in the future and to what, uh, what level of commitments we can expect. If we look at the defense budgets, first of all, the first indicator, because if you want to provide weapons to the Ukrainians in the future, you need to have invested in your own military uh, to be able to do so. Well, there's the, the NATO is divided in three categories. Ten allies or so have spent more than 2% of their GDP on defense. These, are, of course, is US, UK, France, Poland, the Baltic countries, and a few more. Another 10 have committed to doing so between now and 2033 for Denmark and Germany and Spain for an undetermined end date. So maybe one day they'll have invested in their military to the, to the commitment that they've reached, that they were supposed, to, uh, that they have committed into uh, in 2014 and they were supposed to achieve in 2024. And 10 allies, including uh, uh, countries uh, uh, like Canada, have no intention to achieve that 2%. Belgium is that category, Portugal and others. Looking at that, only a few countries would have the capacity to continue uh, to provide significant Western aid uh, to, to, the, to the Ukrainian military. If you look at the current providers of support, the second indicator, of course, the United States is massively given, to get, have given uh, disproportionately to, to uh, Ukraine compared to other countries. But if you look at the person of GDP, it's actually in the second tier uh, group. The first tier, uh, the, those countries that provide more than 0.5% of their GDP to Ukraine are Estonia, Latvia, Poland, Lithuania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, Denmark, and the Netherlands. These are the, the first tier countries. They have limited capabilities, but they are sustaining a lot of that military assistance. 
the second tier supporters, you have the US, uh, Germany, and Spain that have provided more than 0.4% of their GDP. And the third uh, group, which is 0.3% or less, you can include France, the UK, Canada, and Italy, those countries that could be doing more, that are not doing as much as their other allies. And the third indicator is, of course, uh, the public opinion. Can those Western countries continue to provide weapons to the level that they're doing right now without sustaining electoral costs? Because this is one thing that democracies need to live with. Well, if you look at the US, the major provider, uh, it's not going well. Uh, I think there's a window of two years only of, of uh, continuous supports. Given the rise of opposition among uh, the Republican uh, voters, it went for, for those who say uh, that the US is providing too much aid to Ukraine, uh, the, the, um, the support for that position went from 9% in March 2022 to 40% in January 2023. And this trend is increasingly, uh, is, is on a, an increasing path. If you look at other countries, uh, Germany is deeply divided, where you have 64% of the population against providing fighter jets. 35% uh, of, of Germans think that their country is providing too much aid, and only 15% not enough. Uh, we have waning, uh, waning support in Canada as well. So it went from 74% to 62% of to that support continued military assistance. And only at three countries have a relatively stable uh, public opinion, support, public support for continuous aid, France, Poland, and the UK. These are important countries, important providers, but not to the level that the US is. And that would thus, I think, lead me to expect that we... There's a very short period of time that we can expect continued and increasing military assistance, and more should be done right now because that window of opportunity will soon be closed. Thank you, Dr. Popova or Dr. Cheval. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I meant to, uh, uh, so I haven't asked the question yet. What does a future political uh, war settlement look like and what role might the EU play in that settlement? Yeah, I think uh, the EU might play uh, or will play uh, and could play a considerable and crucial uh, role in any post-war uh, settlement uh, by sending a very clear message uh, to Russia that Ukraine will be part of the EU and as a result will be geopolitically part of the West. Um, so Ukraine, of course, has been highly motivated uh, to enter the EU. I mean, that's one of the reasons why they're fighting this war. That's one of the reasons why the war is uh, happening in the first place, uh, because uh, Ukraine uh, intends to uh, pursue European integration. And uh, given that Russia is not pursuing European integration, those were irreconcilable uh, goals, being with Russia, being in Europe. Uh, and Russia is trying to stop Ukraine from this, uh, from pursuing this goal. So uh, Ukraine, of course, is highly motivated to be in the EU. But what's more important here is that uh, Ukraine in the EU will actually have uh, a deterrent message in some way to uh, to Russia, in the sense that. Um, not deterrence in the military sense, but uh, it will send a clear message to Russia that Ukraine has recategorized, so to speak. It is no longer in uh, the Russian sphere of influence. It is pursuing European integration. And that uh, coming to terms with that reality uh, will help Russia move away from its war goals. I mean, part of the reason why uh, Russia has um, maintained this goal of controlling Ukraine is that the EU and the West more generally was not actually fully welcoming to Ukraine. It was kind of pursuing this partial um, partial um, welcoming where, you know, they were always concerned about what Russia may be thinking, uh, what Russia's preferences are here, always trying to accommodate. So there was no decisive 
um, decisive steps to uh, incorporate Ukraine into the West as Ukraine's goal has been for the last uh, eight years. And if the after this war is over, the EU actually commits to this, um, and we've seen some signs that there is a uh, realization, increasing realization of what the stakes are in the EU. And so, for example, the um, the foreign policy commissioner of the EU uh, recently said, well, Ukraine is already in the EU, maybe not formally, but we know that it will be. Um, and, and this is a crucial message that's sent not just to Ukraine to know what they're fighting for, but to Russia uh, to know uh, that uh, they will have to reconsider uh, this goal of, uh, uh, of controlling Ukraine. If Ukraine is in the EU, it will be uh, less and less possible for them to do so. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Professor Chevelle, what did yes, the convoy... uh, very... oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I was just about to ask a, a kind of a follow up question in terms of what did the contours of a post conflict Euro European security architecture look like, assuming we get to some peace? Okay, um, I was uh, what I was going to say. I think Maria just made most of the points um, I wanted to highlight, and I think this uh, integration, decisive integration of Ukraine into Western institutions, is critical. We don't know how the world will end. Uh, Ukraine may be able to regain more territory. It may not. It may be able to regain part of the territory. But I think in whatever, whatever kind of of end we have, um, Ukraine, that um, would be existing at the end of this conflict, I think it's absolutely crucial for it not to be treated as this some sort of in-between land or potentially, you know, not that different from Russia and, you know, or again, these concerns that um, if Ukraine is integrated, um, you know, Russia would get more aggressive because Russia, you know, one, an argument could be made that had Russia been rebuffed earlier, it potentially wouldn't have been launching this invasion now, starting, and I'm not just talking about 2014 in Ukraine, but, you know, Georgia in 2008, um, and we can even go further, you know, to earlier 1990s, the aggressive actions that um, Russia took without essentially any consequences. Also, I think important to keep in mind that if before there was potentially an argument to be made to say, well, Ukrainians themselves were divided on this issue, right? Like, for example, NATO never had majority support um, within the country before 2014. It was less than 20 percent, right? So when Yushchenko began to push for a NATO membership for Ukraine, it was quite easy to say, well, you know, maybe he wants it or the Western, pro-Western government wants it, but not the public. But that has completely changed. There are now overwhelming support for Ukraine's membership in NATO and the EU, approaching 90 percent. I think it's like the recent polls just from this week, it's like 86, 87 percent across all regions. So this whole kind of perception of Ukraine as this divided country, um, part of it wants to be with Russia, uh, um, that just, we, we should abandon that altogether. Um, and again, um, given the effectiveness of Ukrainian military, I think the argument that it's somehow not prepared, I think also doesn't work anymore. Um, and the reforms that Ukrainian government has undertaken in order to become a candidate for the EU, I think these reforms would only be strengthened and accelerated if Ukraine actually uh, has a you know, clear path to membership, meeting conditions, and so forth. And the last thing that I'll mention, you know, with the post Cold War, I mean, post war set settlement, so Ukraine, I think, should definitely be firmly integrated into Western structures. How the West should deal with Russia, I think that's a bit more of an open question, because it greatly depends on what happens within Russia itself, um, right? So one possibility is that, say, Putin stays in power, right? Yes, he cannot prevail militarily. There is some sort of arms um, eventually, right? But he's still in control there, right? I think that can be, I mean, I don't honestly don't see how we can have normalization of relations with Russia under these circumstances, given, you know, the invasion violation of international law, given horrendous human rights violations, right? So any sort of idea that, oh, as soon as they sign some sort of like ceasefire, let's start moving towards integrating Russia. I think that would be a mistake because again, as I was beginning in my first set of comments, saying that um, these kind implications for global security, for rewarding this kind of behavior are huge and hugely negative. Now, if there is a change in regime in Russia, I think then that becomes more of an open question. But even then, I think there should be very clear conditions 
know, that the West would put forth before some sort of re-engagement with post-Putin government could take place, right? Again, it, it involves um, things such as war crime persecution, return of kidnapped children, right, reparations, and more broad kind of acknowledgement that, you know, there has been this imperial mindset and, you know, many in the West are ready to present it as Putin's war on Putin's war in Russian society is, you know, not involved. But I think that's a mistake because not everybody, but very substantial part of Russian society supports this war. They either support it because, again, they believe this whole narrative that Ukrainians are somehow, you know, not not a real nation, so forth, right? They may be victims of propaganda, but the fact remains that there is very broad support for this war and this kind of, you know, perception of Ukraine and other post-Soviet countries as not sort of real countries and Russia is entitled um, to have leverage over them or control over them. I think there has to be concerted effort on the part of whatever post-Putin government might take over to counter this perception and basically deal, you know, with processes and beliefs in, within the society and not just say Putin is out, you know, that's it. We have we have no responsibility and give us more money and integrate us and so forth. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, before I turn to just a quick follow-up question for the all three panelists and it's something that Professor Chevelle just, uh, just alluded to, I do want to encourage members of the audience out in the, 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 uh, on the web to feel free to to submit question and answers. We're gonna to turn to Q&R shortly. And so please feel free to use the chat room or the Q&R box, and then we'll try to get to your questions as quickly as we can. Um, Professor Chevelle, you just concluded with kind of a the, the, the mentioning things like war crimes tribunals and other issues related to transitional justice. And, and we know that this is, this is a very complicated and complex process, and it's very hard to envision right now what these might look like. But um, in your opinion, or all panelists, in your opinion, how important are some sort of post-conflict transitional justice mechanisms, whether they're tribunals, hybrid tribunals, or other type of mechanisms for a lasting peace settlement? And, uh, and I'm not sure if you've given any consideration, but what might this mean in terms of kind of the long-term prospects of some sort of reconciliation between Russia and the Ukrainians, if there's going to be some sort of durable peace going on into the future? I know that sounds somewhat ambitious and optimistic right now, but, uh, uh, but I'm not sure if you've given any consideration to these, these aspects of the post-conflict situation. Um, maybe I'll just start just to follow up on what I was saying. I think that would be absolutely crucial. If we are to have um, any sort of potential for reconciliation uh, between Russia and Ukraine, which one might say is over long term is necessary you know, for lasting peace in that part of the world, I don't see how that can happen if these war crimes go unpunished. Um, again, and that's also perception among vast majority of Ukrainians, including, you know, many people have families in Russia that they, you know, have strong connections. First, I think something like 11 million people have first degree relatives, you know, between the, between the two countries. And um, this narrative that it was just Putin's war and society had nothing to do with it. I mean, Ukrainians know that's not true. They had their families told, tell them, you know, we are coming to liberate you and your Nazis and all of this stuff, or, don't, or not believing them. You know, the, the kidnapping of the children, I think, is a completely tragic situation. I mean, it is really fits the criteria of the Genocide Convention, right, the removing of the children. So, yes, I agree that it would not be easy, but I think it would be absolutely crucial to push for it, um, you know, at every level possible and basically, you know, make it essentially a precondition for any sort of re-engagement with potential post-Putin government that would have to, um, you know, would have to work on this because otherwise I really don't see how, um, you know, we can reach even like years or potentially decades down the road, some sort of stable settlement and some kind of reconciliation. Thank you. So I share uh, Oksana's uh, sentiment, but I think it's highly unlikely to happen. Um, I believe more in a realist uh, peace or a negative peace than a positive peace for the future of, of Russia-Ukraine relationship. Uh, I think to achieve a durable peace, you would need to wipe out Russian nationalism from its uh, imperial ambitions. And that, I think, it's, would be quite an ordeal. 
uh, I, I, I'm not an expert of Russian society, but my understanding is that liberals are, are a very uh, uh, small minority uh, among the population and most have exiled the country. So it would be hard to implement. And to impose justice, you need to have a hand on uh, those criminals. So you would need uh, either uh, to capture Russian uh, commanders or, or, or officials abroad or in Russia. Uh, and I, I think that's uh, that's very unlikely uh, to happen. I, I would put more faith into arming Ukraine and deterring future aggression and letting that sink in Russia to eventually transform its 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 governments and, and its nationalism, uh, it, given its incapacity to achieve its war aims, than to put hope in a fundamental change of Russia's uh, belief systems. Yeah. Thank you. Marie? Yeah. Um, what I'll add here is um, that, of course, yeah, the it has to be recognized that this will be difficult to implement. But I think um, one way in which uh, a, a war crimes tribunal um, might affect post-war uh, dynamics is if it is set up and um, Russian cooperation with this tribunal is linked to uh, existing sanctions and containment mechanisms. It does provide an incentive for domestic actors within Russia to try to push um, and, and, and try to make the argument for change. I mean, I agree with Justin, I don't know how likely that is to happen, but I think uh, we probably shouldn't preemptively give up, you know, uh, because we have the we have the um, uh, example of uh, former Yugoslavia, uh, where uh, the carrot of EU accession uh, worked in order to have a Croatian government come to power that was willing to send uh, war criminals to The Hague in order to move forward. And, and we've seen that for Croatia, it really has worked. For Serbia, less well. But, but the point is that there is some positive uh, precedent uh, there. Um, and, and also, I, I just wanted to uh, highlight that what Russia has been doing uh, in Ukraine um, over the past year actually goes beyond um, war crimes, which are often uh, features, unfortunately, of a lot of wars, um, goes beyond um, the Yugoslav uh, uh, war, for example, uh, because we see really concerted uh, a concerted campaign by Russia not simply uh, you know, to uh, kill people in order to win the war, uh, but a concerted campaign to root, to destroy the Ukrainian political nation. I mean, things like uh, going through libraries and getting rid of all the Ukrainian books, um, that has nothing to do with war aims, right? With uh, winning the war. It is about, it, it is a genocidal intent to destroy uh, the uh, the Ukrainian nation as it is defined by Ukrainians and impose a definition of Ukrainians as little brothers and you know uh, Russians with a weird dialect, uh, which is kind of uh, uh, the Russian conception there. So as a result of that, I think um, the the better comparison uh, and the better sort of precedent that we may need to think about is Nuremberg and, and the idea that we cannot let an attempted uh, genocide, even if uh, it is not uh, as uh, does not produce uh, the level of uh, victims that the Holocaust did, we cannot let um, this go at least, um, you know, the, we can't forego an attempt to do something about it. Let's put it that way. Well, and, and certainly President Biden's recent comments accusing the Russian government of crimes against humanity certainly raised the, 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 the profile of some of these considerations as well. And when you say something of that magnitude, it certainly suggests some sort of at least response, perhaps not immediately, but maybe down the road. So 
Um, are there any questions or responses that the panelists may have towards one another's comments or should we turn to question and answer? perhaps in the audience or, and then we'll, we have a few um, um, brief ones on, on the, 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 the chat room. So perhaps, oh, sure. So we have one from Dylan Reitz who asks about the likelihood of a substantial increase in nuclear development from Russia since their suspensions last resignation from the new START treaty. And, um, and, and what those prospects are. And then kind of a somewhat related question, but it has to do with Russia and its status in the UN Security Council and whether or not Russia's activities calls into question its legitimate status as one of the permanent five and what is the likelihood that the Security Council um, may or the UN may try to remove them from the Security Council, um, which is probably pretty unlikely, even they can veto that, but... So yeah, I think, uh, so, I think uh, Russia has a uh, position on nuclear weapons is, is a longstanding one. Its modernization has begun a few years ago. And it's yeah. the, re the retreat from that treaty, I think, is part of it, an ongoing process mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of modernizing and increasing its deterrence, given its, it also its, its uh, weaknesses and its inability to defeat the Ukrainians right now. It needs to restore some sort of uh, deterrence. And, and part of that strategy a, a rationale i'd say is that it had worked to, to russia's advantage the limited resources that the united states has provided to ukraine is due to that threat of uh, using nuclear weapons by russia uh, it has worked to its advantage to use that threat uh, a lot of capabilities uh, are, are behind the red lines uh, for instance long uh, range uh, long range missiles fighter aircrafts and all of this capability. And if you compare also the level of military commitment from the United States, that despite its, its its massive amounts, it's still a fraction of what it has provided to other wars in the past, whether it's Korean War, the Vietnam War, the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, and the Gulf War, which is the most, the closest war uh, to, to the one we're uh, currently uh, talking about. Uh, it's a third of that cost. And so I think the United States could be doing more. But one of the reasons why it's not is uh, the, the fear of escalation, the use of, of nuclear weapons by, by Russia, given its, its, its uh, threats. Now, would Russia uh, relieve itself from its veto at the UN Security Council? Uh, uh, very unlikely. Um, I think it would argue that uh, if it were to do so, uh, the US should also remove its own veto, having invaded Iraq uh, without the consent of the United Nations. And so uh, that would be a very long discussion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Professor Popova or Professor Chevelle, on questions about Russia nuclear rearmament or re remodernization and or the United Nations Security Council? Um, I guess I'll, I'll comment on the nuclear rearmament to, to say that um, first, um, it's given the problems that we've seen in the conventional uh, military, uh, we can assume that these problems uh, are extend to uh, Russia's nuclear program in the sense of um, you know, corruption issues, uh, promising things uh, and talking, um, uh, talking things up without actually having the ability to back it up uh, in reality. Um, so, uh, but I, I think the Russian sort of nuclear saber rattling has been very, has worked quite well for Russia's war effort. Um, as Justin pointed out, that's the main reason why um, Ukraine is not being helped uh, more at a much higher level. Uh, but I think over the last year, we have, uh, we have seen evidence that uh, chances of nuclear escalation by Russia are actually uh, becoming lower rather than higher as time goes on, as this war goes on, uh, because there's less and less that Russia can achieve with it. Uh, certainly the Ukrainian side has uh, sort of uh, called Russia's bluff. They're not uh, deterred in any way uh, by this. Uh, they've shown no fear. 
um, and uh, not just the armed forces, but society, as uh, as Oksana mentioned. Um, so, um, and Russia has retreated uh, from uh, various uh, defeats on the battlefield without escalation. So, I think this pattern uh, is likely to continue. Thank you. Maybe I'll just briefly comment on the U.S. and a Security Council situation. I agree with Justin that it, it is unlikely that Russia you know, would be removed from U.N. Security Council. At the same time, I think Russia sitting there creates a huge problem. And I think it, it, it damages the credibility of U.N. Security Council and sort of U.N. system, even one can say broadly. And of course, you know, Russia would always point that the U.S. did X, Y, and Z without Security Council resolution. So in a way, you know, we can say it's yet again sort of if we take a broader view that potential problems with the whole architecture, if one of these powerful countries can engage in an aggressive action, right, it's threatening global security and nothing can be done about it, right? Like, can we do better? Is there something to be done? But at the same time, I would also say that um, as unlikely as it is that Russia would be, you know, would be kicked out. I don't think it means that there shouldn't be an attempt to this effect, right? Um, and U Ukraine actually made, um, I, I, I can't remember sort of the, all the details, but I think an argument by legal, international legal argument has been made by Ukraine, how Russia actually inherited the Soviet seat in violation of the you know procedure, there was no vote and so forth. So again, if there was a political will to try to do something about it, I don't think it would be impossible, right? I mean, I think the, the question becomes, is there political will um, on behalf, you know, be it global community more generally, or, you know, say powerful Western countries more specifically, but I think it does great damage to the credibility of the UN system and UN Security Council uh, when Russia continues to sit there. Thank you. So we'll turn to one of our audience members, Alex, one of the prior participants. Hi, this is Alexander Wanoshka. Good seeing you again, Maria, and good meeting you, uh, Oksana. Um, my question is for both of you. And I was happy that Maria mentioned the Nuremberg trials because it actually makes me more pessimistic in the sense that the trials took place in 45, 46. And West German society throughout the rest of the 40s, 50s, and even through the early and mid 1960s, they didn't really have much of a national conversation about the Holocaust and the wrongs of the Second World War. It was only really until the children of the generation that was most directly involved in the Second World War start to ask questions. Then you start seeing documentaries and television series about these sorts of things. Then Vidli Brock becomes chancellor in 68. And then in two years later, he kneels Genflex in front of the monument in Warsaw. And so that's a, that's a whole generation. And even with respect to larger societal trends, we find in opinion polls today that that generation, which would be older right now, obviously, have seen countries in Central Eastern Europe with a certain degree of condescension. Right? This is a conversation that people are certainly having nowadays. Um, so I, I guess it's more of an observation, but I, I guess the question that follows from that observation is like, what are the prospects of the Russian youth, for that matter, who would be watching these things, would be seeing their parents being involved in uh, these sorts of national conversations to the extent that they're happening in Russia. Obviously, it's a very authoritarian context now. Like, to what extent would that be a vector for change in the future? And I think this is going to be a decades long project as well. I don't think, you know, this is actually going to be resolved actually in our lifetime, to be honest. But, uh, but be that as it may, like to what extent could the Russian youth be that vector for some of the decolonization and reconciliation uh, that we talked about in this panel? Maria, would you like to start or? or... Sure. Uh, thanks, Alex, for, for this question. And yeah, I mean, I share your your pessimism that this is going to be a very long process. We we have not seen even the beginning of a start of this process in uh, in Russia. I mean, you would assume it would start from young people, but it hasn't really at all. I mean, uh, there is a small anti-war movement, uh, of course, and a, a lot of brave and, and committed anti-war activists. But if you watch uh, the, the messaging coming from the anti-war 
uh, Russian opposition. It is not a message that recognizes uh, the imperialist uh, underpinnings of this war. It's rather a mess, an anti-war message that is somewhat in line with uh, the imperialist uh, idea. Uh, the, usually the emphasis is um, of this anti-war movement is we should not be killing our little brothers. Um, so it's um, there has to be fundamental change in Russian society to start seeing uh, that the problem was not killing your little brother. The problem was that your little brother did not uh, see uh, themselves in this way at all and rejected that, uh, uh, that classification altogether. And that's what the war is about. So, um, so a long-winded way to say, yes, this will have to start from, from the younger generation, uh, but I think it cannot begin to start an, unless uh, there is a clear reclassification geopolitically of Ukraine as being not in Russia's sphere of influence in order for Russians to start seeing uh, why that is and how did it happen and to start evaluating uh, really their responsibility for the horrible way in which it happened. Thank you. Oksana, did you have? Um, yes, I'll follow up on that. Just make a couple of points. Um, I think, yes, the generational, um, you know, the hypothesis that, it, first of all, that it will take some time, potentially a generation for any such change, and then that the young people are more likely, again, hypothetically speaking, than the older people to um, be engines of change. I mean, that is broadly speaking, probably true. But I don't think generational change by itself, again, for reasons Maria is mentioning, is going gonna, is gonna to do, you know, make a difference. Um, it really has to come, there has to be a concerted policy uh, by the government, um, again, if it is a post-Putin government, uh, uh, to actually want to do this. Because in Germany, of course, the situation was in some sense unique, because Germany was decisively defeated, right? And then when we have you know, the occupational um, powers who basically did things such as making Germans go to concentration camps and wrote school curriculum and all of these things. And that actually wasn't done in East Germany because the Soviet, in the Soviet occupation zone, the general message was that the Nazis were, you know, the guys in the West and in the West Germany and, you know, the East Germans were not really, you know, and we actually see that, you know, generations later, the difference in support for the far right and all of this between in former East and West Germany. So um, again, exa exactly because this sort of, you know, defeat where Ukraine marches into Moscow seems not only Ukraine is not planning on doing that, that seems completely unrealistic, right? So then it would really be on the Russian society to initiate this process, right? At some point down the road. And if they don't, for whatever reason, either because they haven't shed the imperial mentality or because Putin stays in power longer because whoever replaces him, you know, might share the same views. Then I think just to hope gener generational change by itself would produce these kinds of changes. Um, I I don't think that's very likely. Thank you. Um, there was a I, I believe Maria you may have responded to a question um, regarding the in a from one of the the, the webinar participants in the some post or settlement con uh, uh, um, um, you know, negotiations, what is the likelihood of engaging the pro-Russian Ukrainian leaders in the Donbass and Luhansk and Donetsk independently to see if that might be one potential avenue towards a way to come to some sort of peaceful agreement? And so I believe you may have responded online, but I didn't know if Justin or Oksana or... No, I actually responded to a different uh, question oh, online, but this is a this is also a good question. And I think one thing that is important to note here is that those so-called uh, pro-Russian Ukrainian leaders in in Donbas are the creation of Russia, so they're not independent uh, actors. Uh, they don't have different objectives. Uh, from from Russia's objective, so uh, that's in fact one of, one of the successful um, features of the Russian narrative post 2014 was that these 
uh, these uh, so-called back, uh, Russia-backed separatists wanted something from Ukraine, and this could be settled within Ukraine. In fact, they were a tool for Russia to undermine the central Ukrainian government. And, and that's why uh, it was impossible to settle uh, this um, through the Minsk process, because the goal was not to settle it. The goal was to keep this going. Russia's goal was to keep this going in order to have a constant lever at the uh, central uh, Ukrainian government. So engaging with them separately, uh, you know, doesn't really do anything because they're not really uh, separate actors with very different roles or different goals. Thank you. Anybody else? Or, so, well, I have, um, unless there, there are any other questions, I have one, one, one more question that, that it, you know, full disclosure, it's, uh, I borrowed it from foreign policy and I know that Oksana, you responded to it. And it was basically asking experts to respond to the following question. The likely outcome is a negotiated settlement with Ukrainian concessions. And they asked a couple dozen different experts and asked them to agree, disagree, strongly agree, disagree, strongly disagree, or kind of neutral, as well as offer some sort of level of confidence in their prediction or their assessment. So I'm gonna ask all three of you if you can respond to the, the, the or to answer this. So in your opinion, the likely outcome, do you agree or disagree? The likely outcome is a negotiated settlement with Ukrainian concessions. And I'm guessing that means territorial concessions. So my short answer is yes, given what I said before, but not in short term. The short term uh, will be a protracted war. But in the end, the only alternative to a negotiated settlement is to impose total victory on your adversary. And that is highly unlikely. Uh, from the Ukrainians to to uh, go to Moscow and make a regime change and, and change its warnings. So ha having excluded that uh, for obvious reasons, there will be some sort of negotiation on some sort of border. Will it be the 1991, the February uh, 2022, or the current lines, uh, uh, battle lines or future battle lines? I'm not sure. I don't know. There's no crystal ball, ball here. But there will be some sort of negotiation at one point at the end of war when both adversaries are in a conditions to uh, accept and make concessions. The concessions won't be only made by Ukraine, uh, but also by Russia. Of course, uh, this is how a negotiated settlement happens unless one can impose your, your views on your adversary. Um, one uh, option or possibility for that would be to have a third party intervention, say through our OSCE or UN peace operations on the territory that is um, in Ukraine, but occupied by Russia uh, towards a uh, future settlement through, for a, through a referendum or, or, or uh, just a peace imposed by, by a foreign actor. But that is, I think, more a medium to long-term uh, perspective. Nothing in short term is likely like this is likely to happen. Thank you. Maria, um, I would um, I would disagree. I think it is not possible to have a negotiated settlement on both sides. Uh, so I think the more likely outcome is a frozen uh, conflict at, along some kind of line. I mean, so I think in some ways I agree with Justin that depending on capabilities. We're going to see the some sort of line, territorial line, uh, hold. But I think it's more likely uh, that neither side will actually uh, commit to agree to that line. Uh, and we will have uh, some sort of de facto, sort of like the Korean scenario, where there is no treaty, there is no conclusion, but it holds uh, for a long time. and. To me, that is the most likely scenario because, um, because Ukrainian uh, society is unlikely to move. If they're not willing to surrender, even in a hypothetical of uh, a tactical nuclear weapon used, uh, I don't see how it's going to develop 
um, how the potential can develop for them to surrender territory under other circumstances. And if and Russia is not likely to uh, to want to commit to uh, to any line either. I mean, it's not impossible. I'm not confident in this prediction, but I think it's slightly more likely that it will be a frozen rather than a negotiated uh, end. Thank you. And Oksana? Yeah, I will um, have much closer to Maria's view on my, uh, you know, I also don't think negotiated settlement whereby Ukraine would say, okay, Russia, you keep this bit of our territory, we're gonna sign on the dotted line. I think that's just not possible unless there was like, complete defeat of the Ukrainian army, complete withdrawal of Western support, something like really, really that we see no, you know, indication of happening. And then I think the two possibilities, one is exactly what Maria has outlined, some sort of de facto armistice, where Ukraine does not formally give in any of its territory, but it's, you know, it's basic, basically concludes that it does not have the capability to continue say the fight and the same goes for Russia right and we kind of have this Korean scenario at whatever basically frozen conflict without an um, official end, you know, of war, or like, you know, the, the uh, arms streets, right? But I, you know, I guess I'm going to try to be a little bit more optimistic. I, I guess that's something that I began with my comments. I don't think it's completely impossible that Ukraine cannot regain at least some more of its territory, right? How much more? I think that's an open question. But given, you know, that every time, again, the point that we started with, Germany was giving Ukraine helmets, right? And US was giving its javelins. And basically, we're expecting the fall of Kiev in three days, or if maybe in a week. And look how far Ukraine has gone, right? So what Ukrainian people keep saying to the West, believe in us, we can do this, right? Again, I mean, how far, like how much Ukraine can succeed, I think we don't know. I mean, I certainly don't know. But I think this idea that it's sort of reached this point whereby nobody can move anymore. And, you know, we're only going to see like a few villages changing hands, you know, this way or that way. For the next 10 years or whatever i don't think i think it's too early to say that you know ukraine is about to receive you know these tanks and all of these other heavier weapons and um i wouldn't be surprised if you know before the end of this year we might see more territorial change in favor of ukraine right and then again potentially a point could be reached when it can go further right and then we might have this scenario that you know maria just talked about um you know, but it would be a different uh, contact line so to say right but then again, the last point that I'll make, I think if Russia does suffer another significant defeat on the battlefield and loss of more territory, another question mark, which I don't have certainly a prediction for, but I think this is something we should be kind of cognizant of, it may also create processes in Russia that now are not there and they're not even sort of thinking of them as possible because supposedly Putin is probably in control and so forth, and that may remain the case. Or, you know, all of these tensions and cracks and, you know, problems that we know that exist in the regime, a tipping point may be reached, right? And then we would be looking at potentially quite different set of options. Well, we're out of time and I wanted to thank, ask everybody to join me in thanking these wonderful panelists for sharing their time and their expertise with all of us. I don't know about you, but I learned a great deal and I really appreciate it. I also want to once again, thank Jonathan and Hugo and the other organizers for putting together, not only at this round table, but the entire conference. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much to all of you for this uh, great panel. I did learn uh, uh, quite a lot as uh, uh, Jack also pointed out. Thank you again. Uh, before um, um, ending this, uh, this conference, I would like, I guess, to make a couple of takeaways. Uh, things that either we'll learn new things or things that you know we all somehow all knew about, but felt the need to uh, you know, mention once, you know, once again. Uh, I guess the first takeaway, and, and this is something that Alexander Lanovska mentioned uh, in the beginning of his uh, first intervention, if I remember correctly, is that this whole war could have been avoided. Uh, if NATO had shown more cohesion, and if the Biden administration, as well as Western capitals, had exerted more deterrence, uh, things could have been uh, different. Uh, somehow, the way we played the game prior to Russia's intervention in Ukraine suggested that, you know, we were willing to deliver Ukraine on a silver platter to the Russians. Um, we took out our troops and somehow there was a, a you know, you know, a sort of green light uh, for Russia to 
make the initial move. And I think that without President Zelensky's leadership and courage, uh, you know, things would look very different uh, uh, today. And, and, and chances are that uh, we would not be fighting alongside the Ukrainians, but we would have to deal with the fact that the Russians basically were able to take over part of, of, of Ukraine or even the entire country. Uh, so that's the main takeaway. We could have done things differently. Deterrence did not work. The second takeaway, which is a sort of general comment, is that this war is very complex. There are a lot of, you know, lots of unknowns in that war. I think that Michael Kaufman uh, mentioned that, you know, there are a lot of things that we actually don't know. We don't have the intelligence or we, we just don't know a lot of things. I also think that there are many other topics that could we, ha we have covered in this uh, conference, including you know, the role of public opinion in the West. What is it that the Russian population think about uh, this whole war? Uh, what about economic sanctions? We did talk about the impact of economic sanctions, but maybe we could have accorded more time um, to, to cover this topic. Of course, conferences are never perfect. There are always topics that we have to leave aside. So maybe for future discussions or uh, for another conference, we can actually emphasize this, uh, this point. Uh, to go back to Michael Kaufman, uh, he mentioned something interesting that uh, is pretty clear, is that Russia has the hardware. It does have the military capability, but it does not have the organization structure to be successful. Um, now, we'll see this year, as well as in the medium run, whether, whether Russia can actually improve uh, over time and, you know, get better at it, its organization structures. Uh, and also, we'll see if some allies or partners, including China, could actually help in the medium and long run uh, Russia at getting better at it. Another key point, another takeaways, and, and that's something that Anna Celeste uh, mentioned, is that over the last couple of years, the Ukrainians have, you know, built resiliency. Uh, they focused on cyber resiliency, financial system resiliency, and information resiliency. And, and this is very important for them to develop, of course. But this idea of resiliency will make a big difference as long as we, the West, can maintain our military support. Uh, if we're not there, if we're not backing their efforts, I'm afraid that resiliency will not be enough for the, for the Ukrainians to, you know, defending the country and keep pushing the Russians out of the country. So resiliency is key, but we need to support and be behind. Now, what scenario for the future? That was one of the questions addressed uh, on the second panel. Uh, Justin Messi said there are basically three scenarios. Uh, the first one is victory, which is very unlikely uh, for Vladimir Putin to, to win uh, this war, at least you know, at the moment. It's hard to see how he could win it. The second scenario would be a, a negotiate settlement but that the present time, there's actually no appetite in, in Kyiv, as well as in Moscow, to negotiate. So this is very unlikely in the short and medium term. And so we're really facing a protracted conflict. And I think that Maria and Oksana uh, agree with this, uh, with this likely scenario. Now, uh, Maria talked about what an end would mean in this conflict. Uh, and an end of conflict would imply that Russia, according to Maria, and maybe she will correct me if I'm wrong, but, but that Russia stops wanting to reclaim parts of Ukraine. As long as this is a key objective, there's just no way you can end this war. But then for Russia to dump this objective, I think that it would probably imply Putin's departure or overthrow. I don't know exactly how you know, Russia can change its focus because if it does, with Putin in power, that would mean a total you know, defeat and failure uh, for his regime. Another takeaway is, is China, the China factor. What role China could play in war termination? That was one of the questions that was asked. And you seem to all agree that China has no willingness to propose a real peace plan in this war. They just don't put pressure on Russia or they don't put enough pressure on Russia. Therefore, China is not a neutral player in this game, in this war. Uh, it supports Russia and it lacks, and I entirely agree, it lacks credibility. I think that's a point that uh, Maria uh, stressed. 
So I guess the question is then, who could play that role? Who could mediate? Would it, can it be India? Can it be Turkey? I mean, Turkey is definitely working hard to play a role here. I doubt France could do it. It doesn't seem that France have you know, enough leverage in this, uh, in this war, considering the fact that, well, it is not you know, a neutral party, that's for sure. Uh, but I don't see who could really sort of take that role and, and, and make some concrete um, uh, changes or, 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 or help to make some significant progress in that regard. Uh, another takeaway, and I'm almost, I'm almost done, uh, could, could NATO military support Ukraine in the long run? That was another question. And I think Justin Massi basically said that, you know, a few could, but most of them can't uh, because they don't invest enough uh, uh, on defense. And so there are a few of them, the US, the UK, Poland, France, who could in the medium and long run be there and work and, and, and provide military assistance. But clearly it's not the majority of, of NATO members who could actually make a difference. And I doubt Canada could, not, not at the present stage, definitely not. Uh, public opinion is also very important, especially in the United States. That was stressed, right? Uh, there are many people in the U.S. who don't necessarily think that we should do everything that we're doing right now to help the Ukrainians because we should focus on America first, say. And so the question of who's going to be in the White House in January of 2025 is really key. It's really the central element. If Donald Trump comes back, or if Ron DeSantis or someone else is elected, uh, something tells me that um, you know America might change track or modify the current uh, its current support uh, to Ukraine. So this is an unknown. Uh, we have to face it. It's coming soon, January 2025. It's like tomorrow, but that's going to be a key factor. Um, now a few words on reconciliation. Um, panelists indicated that first we must deal with crimes against humanity and definitely that's something that we will have to deal with um, and so reconciliation will take a long time I mean reconciliation took a very long time in Yugoslavia as it was pointed out and things are not entirely settled there 30 years after the Yugoslav, in, the Yugoslav wars and so while I was listening to Alexander Lanovska when he uh, made a comment at the very end of the second panel, uh, I also became uh, more pessimistic. Uh, it will probably take generations for the Ukrainians and the Russians to sort of be able to move to the next step and, and you know, move on together uh, in life as partners, as constructive partners. And so it's going to take a while. Before I turn the floor to my uh, friend and colleague, Hugo Mayer, I would like to thank each of you, uh, chairs and panelists. And so let me mention uh, your names, Michael Kaufman, uh, Elisa Kirke, Alexander Lanovska, Franz Osinga, Anna uh, Cheles, Jack Porter, Justin Messi, Maria Popova, and Oksana Chevelle. Thank you very much to all of you for your participation. It was a great conference. And now, uh, Hugo, uh, the floor is yours for uh, the final remarks. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Jonathan. And I think you've highlighted some really very important takeaways from both round tables. Well, what can I add? Um, this was fantastic. The, the quality of the presentation and the discussions was really excellent, outstanding. I've also personally learned a lot from all of this. Um, and the quality of these roundtables really demonstrate, I think, the need and the importance for solid, rigorous, and fine-grained scholarly analysis in the field of international security. And I would add that it also demonstrates the importance of always linking the study of political dynamics and of military realities, because we can't understand one without understanding the other. And that's exactly what these two roundtables have done so skillfully. And so I really want to thank the chairs and all the speakers for taking the time to share their insights and their analysis with us today. Uh, many thanks also to Michael Kaufman for his keynote address. And of course, a big thank you to the Network for Strategic Analysis 
and the Citadel, and to Jonathan and Larry specifically for all their work in making this conference possible. So I hope that this is the first but not the last instance of this truly transatlantic cooperation between us. And I hope that all of you in the audience enjoy the conference and hopefully we'll see each other again, either online or in person at one of our future events. So thanks to all of you and have a very nice weekend.